What's up? In this video, I'm covering VQGAN uh, or Taming Transformers for High Resolution Image Synthesis paper by Patrick Esser, Robin Rombach, and Bjorn Omer from Heidelberg University. So, as you can see, it's all about uh, image synthesis, and what's exciting about this paper is they are the first to use transformers and achieve high resolution images, as the one you can see here. On the screen, and the thing about this paper is it directly builds off of uh, VQ VAE, and uh, that's a model that was previously uh, developed by DeepMind, and I've covered it in my last video, so do check it out if you don't know anything about it. But like aside from this paper, so aside from VQ again, uh, Dali from OpenAI also uses uh, VQ VAE as the backbone, so that's an important building block currently for these generating models. Uh, and yeah, do check that video out. Uh, okay, having said that, let's see what this paper is all about. So. I mentioned transformers and they say here, we demonstrate how combining the effectiveness of the inductive bias of CNNs with the expressivity of transformers enables them to model and thereby synthesize high resolution images. So this CNN part is just the encoder part of the VQ VAE as we'll soon, soon see. Okay, um, we they say here that we hypothesize that low level image structure is well described by a local connectivity, i.e. a convolutional architecture, whereas this structural assumption ceases to be effective on higher semantic levels. So the idea is to extract certain features which are kind of representative of what image constitutes of and then kind of use transformer to do this sequence token prediction as we'll soon see uh, in order to generate and in order to generate like images which are globally coherent. Um, and that's where the attention pattern of the transformers, which basically uh, treats the underlying data as the fully connected graph, comes comes uh, like useful. Okay. So having said that, let's let's see the the, the high level uh, overview of the architecture. Uh, okay. So first things first, as you can probably recognize, this bottom block here is VQVA, and the training itself of this uh, VQ GAN paper consists out of two stages, so very similar to VQVAE. Basically, you first train the, 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 the VQVAE uh, module, so that's this one, uh, and then you train a prior. Uh, so in the VQVA paper, they use pixel CNN. Here, they're using transformers, or more precisely, they're using GPT-2 model from OpenAI. Okay, if you watch my previous video, uh, you'll see that this structure overall is very similar to the original VQVA paper. So what I've done additionally here is they swapped pixel CNN, and they're not now using state-of-the-art sequence modeling uh, model, and that's transformer, GPT-2 in this case. And they also improved upon the reconstruction loss. They're not using MSC, they're using perception loss plus adversarial loss instead. So there is a lot of overlap between the two projects, but like this project got a, a much better, much better like imagery and high res imagery. So yeah, let's see how it works. So again, you have the VQVA component here. What you do is you have your image, uh, you encode it, you get uh, some latent representations, and then you snap these latent vectors onto these codebook vectors so that you have this discrete representation here, which you then feed back into the decoder in order to reconstruct the image. So that's the, the high level uh, picture of how that works. And again, like just as a reminder, uh, this system is, is trained in two stages. The stage one is you learn to train this VQVA model, you learn how to, uh, to, to kind of uh, create this high quality uh, latent uh, vectors, and then once you have that, you freeze everything. You, you freeze the in decoder, you freeze the encoder, you freeze the codebook, and you train the transformer across this discrete latent space. Okay, that's the, the high level idea of how the system is trained. So now let's see what are the differences between uh, VQVAE and this paper. So the main difference here in the stage one is they are not using, uh, they're not using MSE. So they are instead using uh, perceptual loss plus adversarial loss. So perceptual loss just, uh, it comes from the, to the best of my knowledge, it comes from the neural style transfer literature. And so what you do is you basically take an, an image. So you'll take uh, this original image, you'll feed it into a pre-trained uh, CNN, like maybe uh, VGG net or something. So this is your CNN, you feed in the original image. So let's denote that as X and you feed in the reconstructed image and let's denote that as X hat. And what you then do, you just take a certain layer from this VGG, from this pre-trained CNN, and you extract those feature maps. So that will be something like this, okay? So that's gonna be, these are the channels, height and width, okay. And you do the same thing for the uh, original image, so you also extract those features there. And what you do then instead, is you ju just apply MSU loss, but this time not in the image space, but, but across this feature space. That's the only difference. And um, 
The, the reason that functions is because the classifier already learned how to extract some valuable features and it's just unreasonably effective, okay? And uh, aside from that, they also have this adversarial component. So uh, as you may know, the original VQVAE had a problem with blur and we, we, we already know that GANs kind of improved that. They make much more crispier image. So it was uh, like a, uh, actually the original authors of VQVA paper, paper also like uh, uh, suggested using GANs in the future work. So here, here it is. So they are using uh, patch GAN. So what it does, uh, so what's, uh, what's the difference between that and your regular GAN? You usually have just a single output, like follow, like uh, you have like something like a sigmoid activation function, and then you're trying to train the discriminator to discriminate between real data and fake data. So here it's the same thing instead, but like the only difference is you're taking patches, like overlapping patches, like maybe this thing, and then you'll have this, and you'll have another patch, and you have like four patches in together, and you can see it will the discriminator will output some values here. So if this image was a real image, we'd expect it to output, for example, all all of these should be R or one, whatever that like whatever the value, however you decide to encode the real values. And so you basically train, let's let's say these are like zero to one values, you'll just do your minus loss, so basically your cross entropy, and you're gonna train this patch-based discriminator the usual way. Um, okay, so I'll get into a bit more details about the GAN loss, but this is roughly how it works like. So they have patch-based GAN, all of that taken together, so the perceptual loss plus this GAN loss, so these two together, uh, give much more crispier image as a reconstruction here from this VQVAE pipeline. Okay, the second step, once you train that, once you have these uh, code vectors, what you do is you just train the transformer on a sequence prediction task. So how the procedure looks like, you take an image when you're training your transformer, you feed it into the encoder, which is frozen, you get some uh, sequence, as you can see here, of discrete symbols, and these symbols are just indices into this uh, code book vector table. And you now try try and train your uh, transformer as a basically as a, as a sequence predictor. So how that looks like is your, you, this will be your target sequence. So this one, 42, 33, et cetera. And uh, what you do is you'll have some like special token, like a start of the sequence token, and then you'll just shift this whole array by one to the right. So you'll have one, 42, you have three, etc. And now you just feed this input into your transformer. I'll go uh, like you, you, you do a couple of layers of transformer the usual way. And then uh, you basically do uh, cross entropy, uh, again, to to train and back prop through your transformer to train it. So here is an example we have here at 22. And so we know because of this here that the next uh, symbol is 57. So how it will be trained is we'll find like element 57. So it may be here we'll find its probability that, let me denote that as like pi sub 57, and we'll just do minus log of that probability, okay? And so in order for this to, for the loss to get down to zero, you wanna push P57 to one, because we know that's the true uh, symbol as you can see here. So just usual, usual sequence prediction and stuff, uh, nothing special there. So if you understand transformers, if you understand GANs, and if you understand the VQVAEs, this is super trivial to understand. Just connecting those components, you get the system and voila. Okay, so that was the high level overview. Uh, now let's, uh, let me just show you one more thing. So there, there is one thing I, I need to, know, to, to mention here, and that's that uh, compared to OpenAI, uh, these guys are from Heidelberg, so I guess they didn't have as much compute as OpenAI, obviously. And so they are constrained to have only 16 by 16 discrete latent space here. So their transformer can only work with these many tokens, okay? So that's 256. And so that means uh, you can't have a super big image in the input because they, what I've also noticed is if they go, if they kind of uh, decimate the spatial extent, like the spatial dimension of this image by more than 16x, uh, so what happens is uh, the reconstruction starts degrading severely. So they are kind of uh, limited to train the system on a 256 times 256 images, okay? Because of these two things I just mentioned. So this constrains you to, because reconstruction loss will suffer if you start uh, like reducing the spatial dimension by a lot. And also transformer cannot have more than 16 by 16. So take those two together and you get like that their images are 256 by 256. So now how do they get the high res images is pretty simple. So they just do sliding window across this uh, discrete space. So let me just show you that 
they have it somewhere here. Okay, so what I do is because uh, obviously we have only we can only fit 256 tokens into the transformer. They just do this sliding window across, and um, that's how they generate more than 256 tokens. And then they just plug that in into the decoder, which is a fully convolutional neural network, so we can just accept variable number to tokens. So that's how I understood this works. If uh, may I may be wrong, like comment down if, if if you think there is something else they're doing. But yeah, uh, they also mentioned here that um, so. There is an assumption, the uh, implicit assumption they they have in order for this to work, and they say here our VQ again ensures that the available context is still sufficient to faithfully model images as long as either the statistics of the dataset are approximately spatially invariant or spatial conditioning information is available. So in practice, they mentioned that even if that's uh, kind of violated, there is this Coco Gam paper where they showed they can they can take these smaller patches and kind of combine them uh, into a bigger image without any seams, and that's that sounds really good. Um, okay, so that's the, the the whole how the whole system looks like. Again, um, once once you what I haven't mentioned is once you train the system, how they generate novel images is so you just prompt your transformer. So with the special symbol, it will generate some token, like three, I don't know, then you feed three back into the input because it's autoregressive, out comes some novel symbol, like maybe 21, and again, you put 21 here and you repeat, okay? Until you get 16 by 16 tokens here or more, and then you just feed that through this decoder, which was frozen from the stage one of the training and out comes the image, okay? So that's that's it. Uh, now let's start digging into the details. Um, uh, first thing, I, wa I want to contrast, contrast this work with ImageGPT. And they mentioned here, so previous work, so this is ImageGPT, which applied transformers to image generation, demonstrated promising results for images up to a size of 64 by 64 pixels, but due to the quadratically increasing cost in sequence length, cannot simply be scaled to higher resolutions. So as you may know, like transformers have that uh, like uh, quadratic complexity because every token is attending to every other token. So you have n square complexity. And so this image GPT paper, instead of working in the discrete latent space like here, they were working directly in the image space. And because they are working in the image space, they cannot generate like images of that high of a resolution like when we have a decoder and working when we are regressing, when we are predicting next tokens in the discrete latent space. So that's what that, that approach was bound to fail. But like, uh, like you can see the inception of this very same idea was already there and in the VQVA paper. So yeah. Okay. So um, let me kind of explain the loss components in a bit more detail. Um, so I, I assume you already are familiar with VQVAE. So again, we have reconstruction loss in the original paper. So this is just the L2 squared. So your MSC loss. So what this two, uh, what this term does, and what this term does is the following: you take the the uh, those uh, code book vectors and you push them towards the encoded vectors. So this E of X is just this thing here. So these are the E of X vectors, okay? And SG just means stop gradient. So you freeze those and you push the code vectors towards those, and you also then freeze the encoded vectors and you push the uh, no, sorry, you, you, you actually, you, you freeze the, the, the code book vectors and you push the encoded vectors towards those. And by doing that, you, you, you get, that's the VQVAE uh, in a nutshell. Uh, and now the, the interesting thing this paper does is they change this. So they're not using MSC anymore. They sit here. So we replace the L2 loss used in, in the original paper for the reconstruction loss by a perceptual loss and introduce an adversarial training procedure with a patch-based generator, discriminator. So here is here is your here is your usual adversarial loss. So we have uh, this equation here, and what happens is so just a small recap. Uh, basically, discriminator wants to maximize this function, this this uh, this term here, and uh, generator wants to minimize it. In order for the discriminator to maximize this, what it needs to do is so uh, this is discriminator, and you want to push it to to one because for real images, right, for x, because uh, log of one will be zero, and uh, that's maximizing this, this term here. And here, because these are fake images, x hat is fake, uh, i.e. generated images, so you wanna make sure that the discriminator outputs zero here. So that means it can discriminate between the fake and the real images. And when this goes to zero, log of one is zero, so that means we, we've just maximized this whole equation, okay? On the other hand, um, the generator wants to trick the discriminator into thinking that the images it generates are real. So it wants to instead 
like minimize this thing and it minimizes it by just pushing this to one. When you have this going to one, log of zero tends to minus infinity and so basically that's minimizing this equation. So th that's that's just the minimax game uh, like setup of your regular GAN training. And the final the final loss of the VQVAE of this modified VQVAE model is you just wanna, as you can see we have E, that's encoder, G generator and Z, the codebook table, we wanna minimize so we minimize according to the, like tweaking those uh, those parameters. We minimize this VQ loss, and then we also actually have uh, the the GAN component, which is maximized by discriminator and minimized by these three components here. Okay, so the generator actually tries to minimize this GAN component, and that's that's it. That's your that's the whole loss function. Um, additionally, they have this lambda weight, which seems a bit arbitrary to be honest I didn't see any ablations on this but like they found a adaptive way to kind of tweak this lambda uh, which is a coefficient that stands with this GAN component of the loss function okay um, so that's the the first stage of the training and the second part as I already mentioned is training the transformer so they say here uh, so thus after choosing some ordering of the indices in S where S is just, uh, that's your token sequence, so that's, this is S, all of these uh, symbols are S. And um, the ordering they mention here is the following thing. So let me just clarify this part a bit. So you can, you usually take the raster order. So what you'll usually do, so you have this table, let me just redraw it here for clarity. Um, what you'll do is you need to somehow impose an order because this is a matrix and there is no inherent like linear like you have to linearize this right and usually people just do like rest order so that's how you're going to predict the tokens so because in order to have next to token defined you need to kind of make this assumption of a rest order but they also try doing uh, spirals uh, like outgoing spirals and ingoing spirals and uh, the rest order uh, turned out to work the best so they kind of stuck with it and used it as the other papers prior to this one um, okay, so so after choosing some ordering of the indices in S, image generation can be formulated as autoregressive next index prediction. Given previous indices, the transformer learns to predict the distribution of possible next indices, i.e. this term here, to compute the likelihood of the full representation. So the joint is ju just uh, modeled as a product of these conditionals, okay? And finally, in order to train the transformer, you just apply the cross entropy I already mentioned, okay? Uh, now, interesting part is this one. If you want to condition this, and they condition uh, the transformer on multitude, like on very different modalities, so you can condition this transformer on a bunch of things. You can condition it on a class. You can condition it on a like image that was that has semantic segmentation applied to it, etc. So they show here. Let me show you just some examples. So here, as you can see. You have this image which is uh, semantically segmented, and you're trying to, given that as a condition, you're trying to generate some novel images here, as you can see on the right. Okay, so let, let me show you how they kind of make that work. So uh, they say here, if the conditioning information C has spatial extent, so as the, that semantic masks, uh, we first learn in other VQ again to obtain again an index based representation R uh, with the newly obtained cookbook, codebook um, <laughs> Z. Due to the autoregressive structure of the transformer, we can then simply prepend R to S. So if you don't understand that, let me kind of clarify it. I think it's fairly simple. Now let's see how this procedure will look like. Basically, you'll have a in additional VQ again. Okay, so this is your encoder. One, you have a discrete latent space. You have a decoder. So you train this thing on those semantic masks. So this is decoder one. Okay, so you train this thing on your like semantic masks. And once it's trained, you just freeze it up and then you do the following thing. So you, you have your target VQ again. So this one will just be um, encoding the regular images. And what you'll do is the following during the training of this one. So you take the input image, you encode it, you get the target sequence. So this is your target sequence. And how your input will be formed is the following. So you take a semantic mask, you'll just uh, get some tokens here, you flatten it out, and you prepend it here. And now uh, what you do is you just take your special token, you place it here, you take your sequence here, you just shift it by one uh, like position to the right, and this is your input to the transformer, this is your target, 
and you again train it on a simple simple sequence prediction problem. So that's how they all train this uh, this this model. And then later during generation, obviously you're just going to prepend the the semantic mask and the prompting mask uh, token, and you then just going to sample from your transformer to get the output image, which you'll just feed through the transformer. So the output sequence, and which you'll then just feed to the decoder. Okay. So yeah, that was pretty much thorough explanation of how this system works. Um, hopefully that was useful. I went into a bit more details than usually. So let me know whether you find this kind of in-depth explanation useful or should I just concentrate on like a high level explanation and just uh, stick to the key points of the paper. Okay. Um, so that was it. Um, now let's see some experiments and some comparisons. Okay, in, in this table they just compare uh, and kind of justify the use of transformer instead of some other autoregressive model. Uh, like uh, as I mentioned, VQVA originally used Pixel CNN. Pixel Snail is just an improvement from that very same family. Uh, and you can see here that because this one trains 2x faster, uh, they have two comparisons. So they have a comparison where they train GPT-2 for the same amount of time as PSnail. And, uh, and basically you can see we have an improvement here because these numbers are lower, lower is better for NLL. And again, when you have the same number of steps, it's even better. So that kind of justifies the, the, the usage of transformers, although I think it's at this point of time, it's pretty obvious that transformers are better uh, than those types of models. Okay, uh, here are some results. Um, basically, they, they can do multiple things and that's, that's the premise of this paper. Uh, you'll later see that they, they are on pair with other methods, but they don't don't try to, and say that they are better. They are just on pair, but they are really diverse. They can apply this to many different modalities. So one thing you can do is you can take this image here, you can uh, encode it and use it to prompt the transformer in order to generate uh, by sampling different images. And when I say sampling, again, uh, when you take this as, as the context and you're trying to predict the next token, okay, uh, so this token will have some distribution uh, outputted from the transformer, right? And so there, there are multiple ways you can do sampling from a distribution. One is to do a greedy approach, so you just take the token that has the highest probability. One is to do, and that's what uh, these uh, like uh, folks did, uh, is a top k sampling. That means, for example, if k equals three, you'll take the uh, three tokens with highest probability. So that would be like that would be these three here. And then you just reweight them so that the, they sum up to one, and you'll just sample according to their weights. And that's how you avoid these sampling these uh, super small probability uh, tokens, which would be the case if we were using your regular sampling. So not the greedy, not top k, but just a regular sampling where you're taking into consideration all of the tokens with their corresponding probabilities. So uh, that's one task. You can uh, aside from semantic masks, you can use depth masks, as you can see. They get these weird pigeons. They scare the shit out of me, but like, yeah, uh, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, additionally, you can see they, they can kind of uh, condition on these uh, pose uh, kind of images and you, you get these you get these as output. Like, I think this girl broke her, her leg, but yeah, okay, she'll survive. And finally, you have class conditioning. So basically they conditioned on a class label of a frog and they generate these novel uh, scary fr frogs. Okay, and um, additionally, they, they have something called rejection sampling. We'll get to that in a moment. But like using that, they can they can achieve much better. They can get much better uh, images than these here. I think these are, were not obtained by using this uh, rejection sampling. Okay, um, let's see other results. So again, these are some awesome images they can obtain using uh, semantic segmentation masks. Here on the right, you can see again like depth images, semantic masks, edges. Uh, super resolution, bunch of different tasks they can apply this on. Uh, as I mentioned, they, they, they say they are on par with other methods. So for this uh, semantic image synthesis, they compare with the spade. It's a, even a bit better. So spade is a bit better than their approach, but yeah. Um, okay. Finally, comparing to other methods on the face synthesis, face image synthesis task, uh, looking at the FIDs, we can see that uh, this, this paper is a bit worse than this PGGAN. Uh, and it's a lot worse than StyleGAN2, looking at the FID metric, so fresh A's inception distance metric. Uh, they are way worse compared to StyleGAN, but as I said, they are not claiming they are, they are better uh, in that sense, they are just more general 
and yeah, and they're the first to have used transformers to generate these high res images. Okay. Um, similarly here, if we focus on FID, we can see that uh, without so keeping this acceptance rate, so that's the rejection sampling I was mentioning about. So um, if you keep it at one, you can see that they arrive at FIDs of maybe 15, and that's worse than many of these methods here. Okay, but if you start applying this rejection sampling, they drop the FID down to five, which is much better or on pair with these methods. But they can also use rejection sampling, so I guess this is not that fair of a comparison. By the way, they use uh, ResNet, they say it's somewhere here, they use ResNet 101 to do this rejection sampling, uh, so here. But instead, like if you'd use some, 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 something better, like a clip model from OpenAI, uh, they can achieve even better results, and you'll see those uh, all, all around, like on Twitter, uh, people using VQGAM plus clip to generate uh, like nice images. And so the whole trick with those uh, rejection sampling is the following. So you output uh, a couple of images from your, you sample a couple of images from your, uh, like from VQ again, and what you then do is you feed these into, into for example, clip, and you prompt clip with a specific class. So for example, you, you, you have class, class one, whatever that may, may be, like a frog or whatever. And uh, what clip will do, it will say how probable this picture is to be of a class one. So maybe this one will be, I don't know, 0 0.7, this one will be 0 0.85 or something, this one will be, I don't know, 0 0.6. And so you can just sort them, sort the images according to these scores and just pick the top three or top five, whatever. And uh, what it turns out, it turns out this kind of is an automatic way of cherry picking. So it additionally improves upon the results that this paper achieved, reported. Okay. Um, what I show here is how that downsampling in the encoder affects the results. So what I do is they keep the latent space at 16 by 16. And then what I do is you can see here um, the number of times that the spatial uh, extent of the image has been reduced. So 16 means that the original image was 256 by 256. Uh, one means basically input image was 16 by 16. And that means that during the training, they actually have to take a crop of 16 by 16 here and uh, directly uh, train the transformer on that. And as you can see, the receptive field is much, much, much smaller when you have F1. And because of that, you get these weird Picasso looking images. And I, I really think like uh, somebody can earn some money by just producing these and selling them as artwork. If somebody earns some money, consider becoming a patron of the Epiphany. Yeah, that would be nice. Um, okay, uh, when they use F2, so that's a bit higher. Um, receptive field, you can see it kind of gets better, but this really freaks me out. And then additionally, it gets better and better. And finally, when you have 16, assuming these are 256 images, meaning uh, basically you had a receptive field was spanning the whole image, and that's why we get much better results here. Additionally, these are much faster to generate, so we have a huge uh, improvement in sp speed up compared to when you're trying to regress this in the pixel space, because here you'll have to regress uh, all of the pixels, whereas here you'll just have to regress uh, these 16 by 16 in the latent space and then decode it. So that's why we get a huge speed up. Um, okay, I think that's pretty much it. Let me just show you a couple more things that's kind of interesting. So here they show that they are better than Delhi and VQVAE too. Uh, when we look at the FIDs of the reconstructed images. So you just, they just compare, they take the validation images, for example, so that's this uh, FID slash val. So they pass it through the enco encoder and then decoder, and then they just calculate the FID. And so this just shows that the reconstructions coming from this VQGAM paper are better than Delhi uh, and VQVAE, as we can expect, because as I mentioned, they are blurry because they're not using adversarial component, neither do they use perceptual loss. Okay. Uh, one more interesting thing I want to show you in the ap appendix. Um, so basically here is that visualize what I just explained. You have DALI here, you have VQGAN here. You can see these images are much more blurry compared to VQGAN, which has adversarial component. So that's really cool. Uh, GANs are familiar, like famous for, for making images much more crispy. They have many more uh, diagrams and, and, and pics they've uh, included in the appendix. It's huge, it's got maybe 50 pages. You can check it out, some of the images there. But that was, in a nutshell, everything I wanted to cover today. Uh, if you found this video useful, share it out, subscribe, and until next time, bye-bye.